First let's start by defining calculus. Calculus is the mathematical study of continuous change, in the same way that geometry is the study of shape and algebra is the study of generalizations of arithmetic operations. Let's first start by limits. A limit is a value that a function or sequence approaches as the input approaches some number. Let's take a look at this graph, where y is equal to f of x, the function is undefined when x is equal to c, now let's take an x value which is lower than c, this x value corresponds to a particular function. Let's say we bring the x value closer to c, as we increase x, f of x gets bigger too. Now let's take an x value which is greater than c, this x value corresponds to a particular function. Let's bring this closer to c. As the two value get closer to c, the functions are approaching a particular point, this point is our limit. Let's call this limit L. A limit is usually written like this, it means that the limit of f of x as x approaches c is equal to L. Note that we can't just find L by inputting c into the function, since, function of c is undefined. Therefore, it is important to use limits. This idea of bringing two points close to each other can also help us in finding the gradient at a particular point. Let's take a random graph where y is equal to f of x, and there is a point in the graph when x is equal to b. Let's say we want to find the rate of change of y with respect to x at this blue point, how would we do it? We could draw a tangent that only touches that point and then find the gradient of that tangent, but in order to draw a line, we need two points, but we only have this blue point to work with. We could draw another point, a green one, and make a secant line out of those two. The secant line does not represent a tangent line at the blue point, but if we bring the green point closer and closer to the blue point, the secant line would be a better and better approximation of the tangent line. Since we need two points to make a line, green point does not actually equal blue point, but green point keeps approaching blue point. If we keep bringing the green point really, really close to blue, the secant line becomes almost identical to the tangent line. Now we can use these two points to find the gradient of the secant line, and that would be a close approximation of the gradient of the tangent line. By this point, you probably realize the importance of bringing two points close together for finding the gradient. Now, let's take an equation where the function of f of x is equal x squared. Suppose we want to find the gradient at p where x is equal to 1. Like before, we can have a random point, point q, then we can make a secant line, and then bring it closer to p. We can then use the equation of the secant line to get an approximation of the gradient at point p. Note that p cannot equal q, as this would make the gradient undefined. So how would we know what the gradient at p actually is? We can make the gradient of secant line really close to the gradient at p, but not equal to it. Let's look at the formula for the secant line and rearrange it, to get m is equal to x plus 1. As x approaches 1, the gradient would be approaching to 2, so we can make a slight jump and say that if x were to actually be 1, the gradient at point p would actually be 2. In terms of limits, we can write it like this. This says that the gradient will reach 2 when x is approaching 1. Suppose there is a graph of g of x and there was a jump discontinuity when x is equal to d. Over here when x is approaches from the right hand side, it reaches a limit, let's call this limit L. This plus sign after the d tells us that the limit is reaching from the right side. Now let's make the x approach from the left side, when that happens it reaches a limit, let's call it m. As you can see, two different limits are being approached. In this case a limit when x approaches d does not exist, instead you have to specify where if approaches from. As a side note, you probably noticed that the circle here is shaded, that is because the function at this part is defined, while the function is not defined at the point which is not shaded. Now, suppose there was another function, f of x, where the function becomes infinite large when x becomes d from the left side. In this case, we say that limit of f of x when x approaches from left side does not exist, that is because it doesn't reach any particular point, 
instead it just keeps increasing. However we can say that there is a limit when x approaches from the right side. Now, suppose there are three function, f of x, g of x, and s of x, while s of x is the sum of f of x plus g of x, and suppose function f of x, and g of x was approaching a limit, where x is equal to 3. Let's call the limits L and M. Since the two function add up to make S of X, we can say that if the limit of function of S when X approaches 3, is L plus M. From this, we can deduce some of the properties of limits, like this one, and also this one. We can also apply the same logic when multiplying or dividing. Here is a graph of f of x and, a graph of 2 times f of x. If x is approaching 2.5 in graph f of x, then it will come to a limit, which we will call L, but if x is approaching 2.5 in the graph of 2 times f of x, then it will come to a limit, which will be 2 times L. In fact, we can generalize this, and say, that when we are using limits for f of x multiplied by constant k, then we can take the constant out and say that this is equal to the constant being multiplied by the limit of f of x. Now suppose we have a graph of g of x and a graph of g of x squared. If x is approaching 3.5 in the graph of g of x, then it will come to a limit, which we will call m, but if x is approaching 3.5 in the graph of g of x squared, then it will come to a limit, which will be m squared. In fact, we can generalize this, and say, that when we are using limits for any function that is raised by constant k, then we can take the constant out and say that this is equal to the constant k being the exponent of the limit of g of x. Let's see where we can apply this knowledge of limits in real life. Suppose we have a graph where the displacement of a ball dropping downwards is plotted in the y-axis and the seconds is the x-axis, the equation of the graph is written above, where s is the displacement, and t is the time. Suppose we want to find the speed of the ball at the 0.5 second. Let's draw a point there. Like before, we can draw another point, make a secant line and bring the green point as close as possible to the blue point. Let's work out the gradient of the red secant line. We know that the formula is difference in y upon difference in x is this, and we know that formula for the graph is this, so we can put that in our equation. And then we can simplify. Look at this formula here. Since we will bring the green point closer and closer, we can use limits to reduce delta t all the way to zero. As delta t approaches zero, 4.905 times delta t would also become zero. From this, it would be safe to say that the gradient is equal to 9.81 times t1, where t1 is the x-coordinate of the blue point. So there we have it. The speed of the ball when t is 0.5 is equal to 4.905 meters per second. In fact, since gradient is equal to 9.81 t, we can use this to find the gradient at any point in the graph, for example. When t equals 0.2, velocity equals 1.962. When t equals 1.2, velocity equals 11.77 and so on. This is only one of many examples where limits can be applied. I hope you understood the topic properly and thank you for watching, don't forget to like and subscribe.